and you can take that off when you come up. Uh, welcome this morning to Convocation in the King Institute for Faith and Culture. It's a special time to gather every semester for the faculty student lectures at King. If you don't know about this tradition, it goes back to 1960. Um, it is a tradition in which uh, students will choose two faculty members and faculty choose two rising seniors to give a lecture on something of their choosing. And these have been a really wonderful selection of topics from academic topics, things that people are researching already, to personal experiences from a side interest to a current event. All these sorts of things have been the subject of faculty student lectures and they give us a chance to see somebody um, in their element and telling us about something that matters to them. So we're delighted this morning to have one of our two faculty lecturers for 2021-22, who is David Robinson. I'm gonna leave it to Dr. Pate to introduce him. And our spring faculty lecturer will be Don Hudson. We have two student lectures that'll both be in the spring owing to scheduling. Delighted you're here this morning, uh, whether here in person or online. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna have a little break after this until October the 13th. Uh, but we will return with uh, Mariah Liston on October 13 and 14, and then Catherine Patterson on October the 18th. So we'll be advertising those pretty heavily and hope you can join us then. For now, though, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Pate. Good morning. David Robinson is a native of Abingdon, Virginia, and received his BS in accounting from Virginia Tech his Juris Doctorate from George Mason University School of Law, and his Master of Laws in Tax from New York University School of Law. David has professional experience working as an associate in an accounting firm, as a corporate attorney with national law firms, and as in-house counsel for a publicly traded pharmaceutical company. David joined King University in 2011 and has served as the Associate Dean for the School of Business economics and technology since 2012. David loves teaching our students at King and he is a tremendous colleague. David is married to Crystal and father to Luke and Emily. Join me in welcoming David Robinson. Thank you, Dr. Pate. I appreciate your kind words. First, I would like to say that it is truly a blessing to be here today. It is an honor to participate in the faculty student lecture series. So thank you for this opportunity. My parents raised me in the small town of Abingdon, Virginia, which is not too far from here. In fact, the home in which I grew up is exactly 15.4 miles from King University. However, the journey I have taken has covered many more miles, and I'm going to share some of my experiences with you today. This is my 11th year at King, and I am proud to be a part of the King community. I am a firm believer that the people with whom we surround ourselves have a profound effect on who we are and who we become. I love the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. I believe community matters. As you will hear, I have a lot of professional experience. However, being a member of the King faculty is the most rewarding and enjoyable part of my career. Many of you know that I teach law courses in the School of Business. However, my favorite course to teach is King 4000, Christian Faith and Social Responsibility. King 4000 is a senior level seminar where we discuss many things about life following graduation, including the question, what does it mean to lead a meaningful life? Truly, this is a complicated question. Many relate it to the idea of vocation a term originating from the Latin word vocare, which means to call. Over the years, many noted scholars and writers have addressed the concept of vocation. David Brooks, 
a columnist for the New York Times and regular contributor for NPR, has written that we do not find vocation by asking what we want from life. Instead, we find vocation by considering what life is asking of us. To me, this view captures the essence of the famous quote from Frederick Buechner. The place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. In King 4000, we consider the idea of vocation along with many other questions, such as to whom we should listen when we consider issues regarding career and life. For me, it is not a single voice to which I have listened, but rather a collection of voices from family, mentors, and colleagues, all of which have shaped the person I am today. Now for the audience participation part of my discussion. I say this in my class, it's always a dialogue, not a monologue, and I see no reason this should be different. When you started college, how many of you knew what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? Show of hands, if you knew exactly what you wanted to do when you started college. Okay, I see, I see a few hands, fantastic, right? Congratulations to you. It, it's great to have such direction early in your college experience. Conversely, how many had no idea? Show of hands, I can put my hand way up for this one, right? I was uncertain entering college. And as you'll hear, I changed my mind a few times. We can change decisions regarding career. Many so-called experts recommend we listen to our inner voice to find our calling. It took some time for me to, to hear mine. When I was 17 years old, I started my freshman year at Virginia Tech as an engineering student. Why was I an engineering student? Well, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure. I excelled at math and science, and I always expected to attend Virginia Tech. My high school counselor advised me that I had all the skills of a successful engineer. Placement tests in high school directed me to engineering. Who was I to ignore such wisdom? It seemed like the logical choice. It did not matter that I knew little about engineering or what kind of career I would have. As a first generation college student, I did not know to ask such important questions. The first major obstacle I encountered in engineering was five hour calculus. This course met five days a week. Monday through Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. Yes, an unfortunate time slot. Not only did it meet the first semester, but it met the following three semesters as well. No offense to the math department, but I knew after about a month of five-hour calculus from 4 to 5 in the afternoon, I made a mistake. I knew it. I had no interest in calculus. I'd taken it in high school, but I had no interest in this. Maybe I could have endured it for a semester, but not for two years. It seemed like a lifetime to a 17-year-old. So I began to explore other options. One predominant question persisted in my mind, one that many young college students consider. How will I pay the bills when I graduate? How will I make money? Ultimately, this deep question led me to the business school, specifically accounting. I learned that accountants were in high demand. I was good with numbers. It seemed like a good fit. It made sense to me. So I studied business and accounting for the next three years. I graduated, passed the CPA exam, and started my professional career working with a public accounting firm. Let me warn you that the working world is a much different experience than life as a college student. Your responsibilities increase. You have work pressure. You have more bills to pay. There are more demands on your time. While working late one evening, 
A partner in the accounting firm relayed a story to me. He told me that his son in kindergarten drew a family picture as part of a class assignment. In the picture, he included his house, his mom, his brother, and his dog. The teacher asked his son, where is your dad? The boy replied, he's at work. The partner laughed and shook his head, relating this story to me. I guess I work too much, he said. This is just an example of one of those voices I heard along the way. After a year or so, I started to get restless as an accountant. No offense to accountants, I, I was one, right? Fortunately, an opportunity to work on a tax fraud case arose. I was responsible for the numbers, while an attorney was responsible for the argument and the negotiations with the IRS. The attorney's role was more interesting to me. It seemed like a better way to make a living. Although I'd never thought of it before, on the spur of the moment, I decided to attend law school. This may sound crazy, but law school was great. I found it interesting, even though I read more each semester than I read my entire undergraduate career. It was different in that respect, but I enjoyed those three years. In fact, it was so enjoyable that I decided to attend New York University and seek a graduate law degree. Following graduation from NYU, I joined a large law firm in Philadelphia as a corporate associate, focusing on mergers and acquisitions of publicly traded companies. Working for a big law firm has its ups and downs. I enjoyed the type of work I was doing. I learned a lot, but it was hard work, and I mean hard work. It was routine to work deep into the night and on weekends. The lifestyle was brutal. One evening, a young partner in the firm told me about his dad and how he too was a partner in a big Philly firm. He said to me, my dad was really successful, but I never saw him. He was always working. Yet another voice I heard along the way. I recall a time I watched the Super Bowl in a conference room in a New York law firm as I was working through the weekend. And I'm a big sports fan. That was tough. Yet another time I worked 30 straight days on a merger without a day off. I started to question whether this was what I wanted to do with my life. Whether this was what I was supposed to do with my life. I did not have work-life balance, and I was not entirely happy. As I continued the brutal work schedule, I was recruited by a college friend's father from Richmond, Virginia. He ran a small law firm and wanted to expand. After considerable thought, I decided to take the plunge, to try something different. I went from a law firm with over 1,000 attorneys worldwide and 300 in my office to a firm with less than 20 attorneys. What a change. I will never forget my first week with a new firm. I was on a conference call, just me and the client. It lasted until 6 p.m. I opened the door to my office take a break and notice something unusual. I listened and heard nothing. Silence. I was the only one there. At 6 p.m. in the big firm, it may as well have been midday. Here, the workday was ending. What a refreshing change this was. I had found work-life balance. All seemed well. However, I soon began to experience headaches. Initially, it was only a minor 
annoyance. I discussed this with my doctor who suggested we take a wait and see approach and advised me that if Advil took care of the problem, not to worry. He said, you are an attorney. You read and argue for a living. You should expect some headaches. Okay. Unfortunately, the headaches grew worse and my doctor ordered an MRI. Upon arriving for the scan, I met the MRI technician and engaged in some lighthearted conversation trying to ease my nerves. Upon emerging from the MRI, I asked the tech how it looked. His face was ashen and he directed me to go home. He promised I would receive a call that afternoon. Clearly I knew this was not a good sign. Later that day, my doctor informed me I had a mass in my head. The next afternoon, I met with a neurosurgeon who showed me the MRI scan. I had a golf ball sized tumor in the center of my head. I asked the obvious question, how do you remove that? The neurosurgeon had good news and bad news. The good news, he thought he could remove the tumor. The bad news, the tumor was in an unfortunate location, behind the eyes, between the ears, basically in the center of my head. There was a significant risk of complications and deficits. To prepare for the surgery, which is called a craniotomy, I underwent a series of tests spanning two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, the big day arrived. I must admit, I was nervous. Fortunately, the six-hour surgery went well, but recovery was challenging. Thankfully, my family and friends were there through the entire process. This experience had a significant effect on my life. I became acutely aware of the importance of family. I decided that I wanted to be closer to home and to do something that was more meaningful, of more use to others. This experience caused me to consider really for the first time what I wanted to do with my life, why God put me on this earth. The first decision I made was to return to the area where I was raised, here. I lived in Blacksburg, Roanoke, Washington, D.C., New York, Philadelphia, and Richmond, but I was ready to come home. This decision led me back to the Tri-Cities and ultimately to King University. This was a big change for me, and big changes are not easy. We often face criticism from others, and I was no different. Many friends and colleagues were critical of my choice to stop practicing law and start teaching. However, I was confident in my decision. I remember interviewing with the head partner of a law firm during my recruiting days at NYU. He told me that each Sunday night, he looks in the mirror, and when the time comes that he cannot wait to get back to the office on Monday morning, he will then know it is time to find something else to do. As a young law student, I thought he was crazy. However, I now understand. I love teaching and I'm always excited about going to class. I believe this is what I was meant to do, what I was called to do, my vocation. As a corporate attorney, I did not feel I was making a difference. I feel that I am now. 
I believe my experiences, good and bad, prepared me to be an effective teacher. I hope I am making a positive contribution to King and to our community. I encourage you not to feel bad if you don't know what you want to do with the rest of your life. It takes some of us longer than others to find our true calling. I had no idea what was in store for me when I was 17 and leaving home for college. I encourage you to embrace the opportunities that you will have. I believe your experiences will shape you and serve as a foundation for whatever you are called to do. I want to close with a quote from a final paper submitted by a senior in last year's King 4000 class. As I look forward, what I value most about my King education are the friends I've made and the people I have met along the way. Of course, I value my King education, but nothing will ever compare to the friendships and memories that were made at King University. King is a strong learning community, one of which I am blessed to be a part. I wish you well and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, David, for those uh, inspirational words and for sharing your story with us. And thank you for being part of the King University community. You're dismissed. Have a great day. Oh, revise that. Make it a great day. Take care. <laughs>